Okay, so this is us. This is the people who make uh, magnet seminars. And just a cute, uh, quick reminder, reminder of the format of the talks. Uh, talks should last 25 to 30 minutes. Please keep your microphones muted uh, during uh, the talk. We will have time for questions when the talk is, is finished. If you don't want to read your question out loud, you just add no mic and I will read them for you. And uh, after the questions, we have time to catch up uh, for an informal uh, socializing and that time will not be recorded. Uh, today's talk will be given by Franz Lagroix I hope I said it right. Uh, and the title is European Less and Paleosol Sequences Archiving Quaternary Climate and Environmental Change. Um, so, well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to present uh, in the Magnets uh, seminar. It's a very, very, very nice initiative that I've said before, and it's a very nice thing that you guys are organizing all of this. So today I will be talking about European Lus and Paleosol and uh, present some aspects of uh, quaternary climate and environmental change that are archived in, in these deposits. Um, so first, it's my name on the slide, but it's a collective work of many, many other people that, that I've listed here, a slew of undergraduate and graduate students, um, and a lot of uh, collaborators, uh, researchers. So, Quaternary climate uh, has a lot of uh, key features that, that define it. Uh, one uh, is that it's paced um, by cyclic changes in the global ice volume. So I've depicted he this here with the benthic uh, oxygen isotope and stack record um, with uh, low values, meaning uh, low uh, ice volume. And it's also characterized, it's a time that's also characterized by these alternating uh, periods of glacials and, and interglacials. And this pacing is controlled by the geometry of the Earth's orbit in position, and its position around the sun. And above here is shown the obliquity uh, cycle. So during the first half of the quaternary, um, we can see um, that peaks in, uh, in, uh, in ice, or peaks in, in interglacials, so low ice volumes, um, systematically, almost systematically correlate with uh, high obliquity. There's a few exceptions, but this number of ex exceptions uh, increased significantly in the more recent uh, periods. So in the earlier part of the quaternary, uh, these glacial interglacial cycles are paced by the 41 kilo year obliquity periodicity. And at present, uh, we're more paced on, on 100 kilo year periodicity, which uh, is a uh, characteristic of the eccentricity. The quaternary environment, if we look at that, um, is also has key features. And one is that uh, the quaternary was quite dusty, and there was increased dustiness as the glacial conditions intensified. So here again, the same uh, the oxygen isotope uh, stack um, of Lysak and, and Remo for the last 800,000 years. And the other record is the dust content from uh, Epica uh, Dome C uh, ice core from Antarctica. And we can notice that we have big uh, amounts or large amounts of, of dust content uh, at the peak uh, glacial periods. Now, on top of these longer time scale changes, uh, the quaternary is also characterized by these more abrupt time scales. So we can image this uh, by looking at the last 100,000 years. And if we focus on the two curves that I show here on the top, we have, again, um, oxygen isotope, but now of the end grip, so the Greenland ice core record, uh, and just below uh, the dust content in this ice core record. And we can see that there are abrupt increases 
in dust content and decrease in dust content as we exit these gray bands. And these gray bands are interglacials, uh, Dansker Oscar events. So there's clear evidence that there's a coupling between continental dust, because this dust in the ice core comes from the continents, and in this case, uh, North Atlantic climate. So why should we care? Well, actually mineral dust is a really important uh, climate driver. So mineral dust in the atmosphere is a direct driver of the global climate system. Uh, first of all, by scattering and absorbing incoming solar radiation and the outgoing uh, terrestrial radiation. Um, but mineral dust is also an indirect driver in the global climate system through uh, the formation of clouds and then biogeochemical cycle, for example, the iron fertilization uh, of the ocean by, by the iron in the dust. Um, so it's important to understand mineral dust. And the amount of mineral dust that's going to be in the atmosphere is going to be dependent on the availability of continental uh, dust sources, the efficiency in being able to uplift and transport this to dust sources, and eventually it being deposited. So vegetation, wind speed, precipitation, um, they're all uh, examples of controlling factors that will control the amount uh, of mineral dust that we might have in the, in the atmosphere. And these factors are themselves um, dependent on the global climate system. So there's a mechanism, there's a feedback loop really between dust and, and climate, and the mechanisms of this feedback are really not really clearly understood today and are worth studying. And one way uh, to clarify or to get a deeper understanding is to study uh, records of continental dust sources. So lost deposits are an example of continental dust sources. And they are present on, uh, on every continent. Uh, however, uh, as you can see from the distribution map shown here, um, they are concentrated most, there's more dominant um, dust distribution on the continents in the Northern hemisphere and also uh, within uh, the mid uh, latitude. Across Europe, um, so there's a number of factors that control the origin, the distribution, and the type of less um, uh, and paleosol sequence that uh, will be present and preserved. Uh, so ice sheets, a uh, very important factor, and uh, the extent of ice sheets and the dynamics of, of ice sheets. So on the map that I'm showing here um, is a snapshot of uh, the ice extent in blue. Uh, at the last glacial maximum. And you can also see the second point that I'm making here is that sea level is obviously also another very important factor. Um, so the, all the gray, what is presently under the ocean that is exposed here, well, that is actually the exposed continental shelf at the last glacial maximum. So the combination of these two, um, the glaciers, the dynamics of glaciers that are gonna be bringing in as they retreat um, a significant um, uh, amount of, uh, of debris as a glacial outflow, and these exposed uh, continental shelves at uh, maximum glaciations um, are going to be important sources uh, of dust. Um, and as you can see on the map, all the yellow or orangey kind of color is, uh, is the loss distribution, and there's a band that follows uh, more or less the Fennoscandinavian uh, ice sheet and around the Alpine ice sheet, and also uh, along the major uh, European rivers. Um, uh, the distribution of lux are seen. Prevailing wind dynamics is also obviously a, an important uh, factor in controlling where um, these uh, ice sheet and uh, dry ice shelves, uh, dust sources will, will uh, where their material will be transported inwards. 
The relief in the topography of the terrain is also important. Um, it can act as uh, natural dust traps uh, where you're going to have more accumulation. Um, and we've already talked about uh, climate and vegetation. Obviously, uh, when the ground is barren of vegetation, well, it becomes a very nice dust source. Um, and once the vegetation comes back, well, the vegetation is going to act uh, as, a, as a trapping agent uh, to retain. So I'm gonna take you throughout this talk to two different areas. We're gonna start uh, first in the Northern Lust Belt, and I'm gonna focus on these two stars. Um, the more Northern one in France is called, is the Arraipour uh, Lust Deposit, and the other star is the Nusslor Lust Deposit. So all of this Northern Lust Belt here in Europe is, is really in a periglacial environment, just again as a, as to give you an idea, um, you see a purple line out here that goes all the way across. Well, this is the uh, continuous permafrost line at the last glacial maximum. And the dotted purple line that you see uh, running uh, further south is the discontinuous permafrost line. Um, so the Northern Lust Belt is definitely a, a periglacial environment and it's a lot of periglacial processes um, that are at the origin of, of, the, of the lust that is found here. In Western Europe, uh, the lust deposits are generally much thinner and cover the last one or two glacial cycles, as opposed to the more Eastern lust deposits, which where I'll take you uh, a little bit later in the talk. Um, another point about uh, the the, this more Western part of, of European lust is that uh, traditionally based on uh, the lust thicknesses and the geomorphology of the, of the structures, um, it is thought that most of the prevailing uh, dust depositing winds are westerly to northwesterly coming. Some very recent work, I didn't put any of the, uh, of the references, but if you're interested, I can give you those uh, afterwards. But there's some recent geochemical and climate modeling results that are suggesting that for this Western Northern Lus area, um, that easterly and northeasterly winds are, are actually, were actually also important um, dust transporting winds. So like I said, we're first going to go to Avrincourt. So Avrincourt, um, is an open pit uh, 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 excavation. It was it's a it's an area that was that was opened up for an archaeological rescue mission. Um, so these are really good because they do all the work of of cleaning. So it makes our lives uh, significantly easier. And they're generally, as you can see from the size here of the pit that I'm showing on the graph, um, very wide. And so you have a good three dimensional view. Uh, of, of the whole deposit of, of the area. So these are very, very valuable um, types of, of excavation. So this, the little profile that I'm showing you here, that's about five meters in length, is this one here, P5. And there are lots of work that was done on this, uh, including uh, OSL and carbon dating. But what I'm going to just quickly show you is a, a, a really nice little study on all of these little green dots, which were oriented samples um, that we took uh, in the field. So this is just a zoom in on all of those little green dots that are nicely wedged in between these two uh, interglacial period that uh, where uh, uh, ice wedging uh, and, and all that was, was happening. So on the first plot here, we have just the mean magnetic susceptibility of the anisotropy tensor uh, of the samples uh, that are plotted here. So as you can see, there's a lot of specimens because we took a lot of specimens at each stratigraphic level to try to have uh, a, a good signif a statistical significance of, uh, of the anisotropies that we're, that we're measuring. Um, and the red dots throughout 
uh, these three plots are the tensor mean of the of the AMS uh, results of the individual specimens at, at a given stratigraphic level. So next we have the degree of anisotropy of the samples, and they increase up to a maximum of 5% about at the mid-level of this unit, and then decrease again uh, as we get uh, closer to the, the cryoturbated surface uh, above. The distribution, as you can see, of all these samples give a very nice uh, horizontal foliation. And there is a, a clustering of, of the K-maxes. Um, they girdle as a population. But then if we look at how stratigraphically um, these K-maximums actually deviate, you can see that they're more or less girdling all over the place in this lower part with the lower anisotropy. And then with the highest anisotropy, we have a very, very nice uh, clustering in the uh, northeast, southwest direction of our maximums. If I superimpose here a, a, a grain size index, a sedimentological grain size index called the, the, the coarse silt index, um, in uh, aeolian uh, LUS uh, studies, uh, this grain size index, when it's above one, indicates that the wind dynamics was quite vigorous um, and uh, definitely able of transporting uh, mineral dust. And at this site, I thought that this was a very uh, cool kind of uh, demonstration of having this wind dynamics uh, index that is mimicking very nicely the degree of anisotropy uh, across this uh, very small but uh, uh, important um, uh, last unit. And our maximum clustering is also associated with the, the highest wind dynamics based on this wind, on this uh, grain size index. So for this site, um, on the previous plot you saw, there was a, a, a sample that was taken at this level for, for chronology, and it gave an age of 33,000 years. Um, so the conclusion at Avaycourt is that at 33,000 years, we had winds in the northeast, uh, south, uh, southwest uh, uh, directions, which are not uh, the, um, the traditionally thought uh, wind directions. So keep this in mind for, for a little bit later. We're going to skip to the other star, so the Nusslor lust deposit. So this deposit um, is in an active uh, quarry, um, and it's actively, it's still actively being quarried today uh, for all the, the limestone that is in this picture below. Um, they don't care so much about all this lust that's on the top, but we do. Um, and this quarry has been investigated now for the last 20 years, and there's been multiple, multiple profiles. So we know a lot about this site. There's been uh, a wide variety, Flip by itself. Um, a wide variety of, uh, of analyses that were done, um, mollus, sedimentology, pedology, plant wax, um, and also uh, magnetism. And very recently, um, well, now it's starting to be a little bit older, but uh, in 2017, um, some of my colleagues developed a, a very novel and fantastic technique of. Um, of trying to uh, carbon date um, uh, these little nodule, which are earthworm uh, uh, nodules. Um, so they're feces. Um, and in the lust deposit, uh, we know that these worms never really moved much more than a couple of centimeters. Um, so the, the, the ages obtained are very, one, they can be very precise because these are quite young. Um, and in terms of the stratigraphy, uh, the, we're getting really ages of, of, uh, of, the, of the levels. So at Nusslor, uh, which is a site that really covers very the most recent um, last glacial, uh, so stage two uh, uh, lust deposit, um, we have a very, very, very high uh, resolution chronology of, of what's going on. And, we had observed in the field um, 
all of these uh, little G units that you can see on the graph here. And these are uh, tundra glay units. And each of these tundra glay units can be correlated temporally independently because of the age model to uh, these interglacial, the Dancer Oscar um, uh, events in, um, in the end grip. Uh, in the end grip record. So this was an is this site is very important because it is a, a really nice example that again the dust cycle uh, what we see in Greenland because the the blue curve on the top here is actually the dust in the in the Greenland ice core um, and the dust deposits in Western Europe are connected. So we got really interested in, um, from a magnetic point of view, of what exactly are these tundra, tundra, tundra glaze. Um, so genetically glaze uh, uh, is a term that is used for a layer of sediment that's been affected by hydromorphic processes uh, due to permanent or temporary water logging. So as I mentioned before in the, in the graph, this area is an area where uh, either continuous or semi-continuous permafrost was present. And LUS is a very permeable uh, material. Um, so the permafrost layers uh, could act as an, as, a, as an impermeable layer and uh, accumulate this water per percolating in to produce conditions that would uh, produce hydromorphic processes, and so features that would be associated with glade. But the interpretation that we were seeing of all of these glades being associated with these interstadials uh, suggests that they are indeed incipient soils. So from a mag magnetic point of view, we wanted to, be, to, to understand, well, magnetically, do they look like incipient soils, or do they look like tundra glade, and are they the same? And because genetically, they're not necessarily the same. Um, so this was one, this was the topic of, a, of a Sam uh, thesis that, uh, that he's uh, already, already published. So one way of trying to decipher um, was to use AMS, um, because with the anisotropic magnetic susceptibility, we can determine uh, the grain orientation and any kind of water logging would uh, induce um, a, a change in, uh, in, the, uh, in the grain alignment. So I'm not gonna go in, in all the details here, but these are basically the AMS results for, for, that, uh, for the P8 uh, profile at this, at this quarry. The blue bands uh, highlight the tundra glaze as they were observed in the field. And the brownish bands here are paleosols that were really observed as paleosols uh, in the field. And based on the geomorphological context and the structural context of the site, um, any primary LUS, we would expect that its magnetic fabric, given this very horizontal uh, limestone base, that any of the any primary fabric at this site should have also a, a horizontal or quasi-horizontal uh, foliation. So what he what he uh, analyzed was in fact there were a significant amount of samples that um, and units uh, consecutive units that had a very uh, primary like fabric with a horizontal uh, foliation. And their minimum, their maximums and intermediate axes uh, uh, girdling around uh, within the foliation plane. But within all this, he detected very discrete samples, so a, a discrete unit, so a discrete un interval is consecutive samples, uh, not just one here, one here, one here, but really consecutive blocks of, of stratigraphy where. The, the anisotropy, the magnetic fabric, significantly deviated uh, from this. As you can see here, here we have a, uh, a, tri a triaxial uh, prolate 
uh, fabric with the minimum actually girdling with the intermediate, and we have uh, significantly inclined uh, foliation planes in, in here. So all of these little uh, levels indicated that, or suggest uh, strongly that these are not primary, but were remobilized after, after deposition. But if we focus on these primary uh, fabric, on these, pri on, on these primary results, the, minim the, the, the tensor mean of this population gives us a maximum orientation that is uh, uh, 70 degrees, so east, northeast. Uh, so we could suggest that this is for the stage two uh, glacial deposit, the prevailing uh, wind direction which again contrasts with the generally accepted uh, northwest, uh, northwesterly wind uh, circulation. If we go into a little bit more detail, so this is the stratigraphic uh, view of the declinations of the AMS fabric um, of the primary of the primary LUS. So these two plots are exactly the same, the, the brightness most plot uh, with the middle, except we've removed the ones that had um, epsilon, so uh, angles of confidence around the K-max declination that were a little bit too large, larger than 22. But if you look at both of these, they're exactly the same. So we're not really removing any wrong data. But if we look at this little less interval that is squeezed in between, this is, which is G2 and, and so uh, tundra glade two and tundra glade one, um, based on the age model uh, that I showed prior, um, this last unit was deposited around 34,000 years ago. So more or less the same time as the last that I showed you at, at Vancouver. And in this little segment, we don't have as much scatter uh, with respect to declination. We have a nice little cluster of no, it's, it's, it's only about 30 centimeters thick of a of LUS unit, but they all cluster in a northeast southwest uh, direction. So if we take these together, they're generally accepted northwesterly winds. And then both of these sites that I just showed you, and so this is, this is the average for stage two, and this is the little direction of the LUS unit that's 34,000 years. And then the grouping um, of, the, of the LUS that's about 33,000 years at, at Rincourt, um, we're starting to have, even though these are small observations here and there, bringing them together now is really giving us confidence that um, we need to go back and, and get better chronologies on multiple sites across this area to try to see whether in through time this is really the dominant when or are we actually seeing just single dust deposition events of, of certain storms and that globally yes the general atmospheric circulation is in this direction but we do have single events that are bringing in um, a significant amount of material uh, from, from other directions. And this is important um, because of the role that mineral dust has in, uh, in the global climate uh, system. It's important to understand this. So I think if I know where I'm going, that uh, so this is more or less what I just said, um, we're going to move now to the eastern part of Europe and I'm checking the time and ha, I'm doing it again. Um, it'll go, I think maybe 10 or 15 minutes, if that's okay. Do I get a thumbs up or 10? Okay, thank you. Um, so the Eastern part of, of Europe, the lust deposits are much, much thicker. Um, uh, they're more continuous. They record multiple glacial interglacial uh, stages. The area is generally drier. We're well below uh, any kind of permafrost or semi-permafrost um, uh, line. And the type of lust deposits in this area 
uh, resemble or mimic a little bit more uh, what we see in, in, uh, in China and Southeast Asia. So the soil formation is not necessarily uh, like in the West where there's complete secession of lust deposition and then soil formation, but there's more uh, a slowed down but continuous uh, deposition of lust even through um, interglacial periods. So I'm gonna focus on briefly on two little sites. Uh, so the east westernmost star here is the Harlots uh, site. And then very briefly on the Suya uh, Kladoneska site near the city of Pleven, um, which is uh, that we're still actively working on. It was a, the topic of uh, Christian Lag's thesis who just defended and is also the topic of a, of a thesis that's just starting um, uh, in uh, Diana and Nelly Jordanova's lab in, in, in Bulgaria. Uh, So the two sites, so Harlots um, is very close to the Danube, which is run, running over here. Um, so being closer to the Danube is, uh, is on one of the terraces of the Danube. So that actually constrains its length uh, to only the last two glacial um, uh, periods, uh, as opposed to the Suya Kladines, which is in an active quarry, this time it's clays that they're quarrying at the bottom and not limestone. But again, they don't care about the lust, but we do. Um, so this site is about uh, 60 or so kilometers uh, away from the Danube. So much, much not affected by uh, the, the terraces of, of the Danube. And the accumulation here um, is much thicker well, the thickness is about the same at both sites, but here we have, uh, as you'll see next, uh, six uh, uh, complexes uh, of paleosols, um, as opposed to, to two complexes of paleosols at, at Harless, with the lower one being a paleosol that is formed in the alluvial uh, material of the Danube uh, plain. There's a Excellent stratigraphic link between these two in the in a tephra that is observable at uh, at the Surya Kladinex site um, was not observable at Harlots, but magnetically we were able to uh, identify it uh, without uh, any problem. Um, so globally, based on the work of, of, uh, of Christian that is uh, published in, in, uh, in this paper and in, uh, in another paper that's in preparation, uh, the Suya Kledonex uh, covers about 800,000 uh, years. And there is a paleomag study that's being conducted to try to find the Bruns Matuyama to, to, to guarantee that this is the right um, the right age model. So at, uh, at Pleven, the one, one point that I'm going to make, there's so many things that we could say, and there's a lot of things that will be said in, in later talks uh, at other conferences and, um, and, and papers. Uh, but the one thing that there's a clear change in all the behavior of the magnetic parameters below this 16 meter line uh, and above. So all the magnetic concentration parameters uh, show much, mostly lower values below uh, and the amplitude between the soil complexes and the lust units above this mark line are much amplified. Uh, relative grain size of ferromagnetic particles are smaller in the paleosols than in the lust. Um, but they differentiate similarly across the entire, uh, the entire uh, sequence. Um, and then concentration of high core acidities, if we look here at HIRM, um, for example, minerals, they increase, as I'm trying to show here with the, the, the line, um, relative to the concentration of ferromagnetic minerals below, below 16 meters. Um, so if you look at uh, when you have HIRM normalized here to chi ferry, um, they're much more important in the lower half uh, than in the upper half, even though throughout it seems to be more or less uh, a constant. Okay. 
So where we have this sharp contrast based on the age model um, that was developed and uh, Christian developed this age model by comparing uh, Delta Chi and uh, a hematite content um, uh, from colorimetry data, uh, Delta, both of these being uh, pedogenic uh, proxies, um, these were compared and correlated to uh, the Lysak and Ramo Delta 018 record. Uh, on the other blue is also from colorimetry data, uh, goethite content. So with all these three, and um, also another uh, parameter of SIRM over CHI that we defend in uh, the Jordan over 2002 paper as being uh, related to wind dynamics. Uh, that proxy he compared more to, to, um, to a dust, to Epica Dome C uh, dust record. So with all these, um, he, was, he built a, an age model and it clearly shows that this sharp transition or change in behavior uh, around the 16 meter mark um, falls at the mid-brooms uh, mid event, mid-brooms climate event. So if you remember in that first slide, that kind of period after the mid-Pleistocene event where the, we transitioned from a 41 kilo year uh, controlled uh, cyclicity of glacial interglacial to uh, 100 kilo year uh, cyclicity of glacial into glacial. Um, and the last, just last quick point that I'll make about this is that from this age model, even though we have a very long time cover um, for 27 meters, which is high, but not that thick for, for, for that time cover, the fact that this site was sampled continuously at a two centimeter, centimeter resolution means that the calculated sedimentation rates that uh, this age model gives for uh, the last glacial, the penultimate glacial and stage 12 glacial um, gives us the right to go in deeper and look at whether we can see any kind of millennial scale climate change. Um, so that's work to be published in the very, very near future. But as, a, as an example of, of, uh, of, of millennial climate change in the penultimate plus uh, at Harlots, because here we also have about 25 meters of lust deposit, but for only two cycles. Um, so even though we sampled this section at a five centimeter continuous resolution, uh, we have, a ver we have uh, the ability to see millennial climate change um, within this within this last unit. So on the left hand side of this plot, I'm showing you some pedogenic indicators, the frequency dependent of susceptibility, uh, A star, which is from the color um, telemetry data. It's an index for redness, uh, higher values, higher, more red. Um, and also then uh, below here, the clay content. Next to that is the greater than 160 micron fraction in, in this section. And very curiously, uh, this size fraction peaks in all of the incipient soils and the paleosol. And our interpretation here is that during the interglacials, um, the actual wind system switches and the tributary that is really, this site is, uh, was carved by um, the, um, by the flow of the, of the tributary uh, is to the east of the site. So it just showed this very, very coarse material is very local and is coming in at this period of time because of, of changes in, in, in wind directions here. But that's not so much the point that I wanted to make is that on the right hand side over here, we have some proxies for wind dynamics uh, so this coarse silt that I already introduced earlier, um, so you can see that it that it is significantly higher uh, during the the uh, during the glacial period, and then this HIRM over Chi F, uh, which we developed also at Pleven, but here first, uh, which is mimicking uh, wind dynamics. It's a magnetic proxy for 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 wind dynamics. 
And HCR that I'm showing here is clearly showing you that in all of these incipient soils and confirmed from the, the stage five soils that the, that the core acidities bring our, our go down uh, during these interglacial and interstadial periods. Um, so wind dynamics go down during these interstadial uh, and interglacial periods. And then if we look at this chunk of unit of LUS, for which visually in the field, we don't really see, we see nothing, meaning that it's the LUS is completely homogeneous, same color, um, really no, no features uh, discernible. We can discern by looking at the data that we have features that are all the same as these incipient soils, meaning lower core cities on multiple, for, for significant intervals um, that are associated with lower wind dynamics. Um, so we truly believe that these are actually uh, periods of interstadial and as because we are further into the, the glacial period, there is significantly less water availability. Um, so we're not producing the same type of, of, of iron dissolution and reprecipitation that we're seeing in the, er, the, the earlier uh, uh, inter, uh, interstadials. And to, to support this is this Delta C13 data that we have um, that there's small excursions, but any small excursions to uh, to, to lower uh, delta C13 values indicate more water availability. So up here again, we do see in certain of these of these levels these small excursions of delta C13. So we believe that from the sedimentology and the, the magnetic proxies that we are actually observing not just these four uh, inter incipient soils, but other incipient soils throughout, um, throughout the, uh, the, the penultimate glacial lust. And in a paper with colleague Denis Rousseau, um, based on correlative uh, uh, investigation, there's a few other sites uh, in other types of archives, such as ice cores and, and, um, and, and lake sediments, uh, for which in the penultimate uh, glacial stages, there are arguments for uh, Dansker Oscar like events. Um, so in this paper, we, we, co we correlate that actually the number that we see here is identical to the number of Dansker Oscar events that some of these other authors have proposed uh, were being observed in, uh, in their Pinocchio glacial uh, period archives. So the North Atlantic climate system, which is where DO events are, 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 are really seen and originate, um, are actually seen all the way into Eastern Europe. Um, so the dust cycle uh, across Europe is connected whether west to the east to the, the global uh, climate system. And we need to continue to work on these to get more understanding. And I will stop here and thank all my collaborators and take any questions if you have some. Okay, friends, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, let me check. Uh, is there any question uh, in the audience? You can raise your, your hand or just turn on the microphone and just. Okay. If, if, if there are not questions yet. Okay, someone have raised the hand. Johan, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, hi, Franz. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I had a question about the differences. So in between different LUS layers, uh, you might observe that the 
grain size of the silt or the sand changes and varies due to various factors. But I was wondering, do you see any difference in the magnetic content or the magnetic grain size of the ferromagnetic particles uh, within the, the list layers? Is that relatively uniform or does it also change? It's um, within the last layers, the, the if, I can, if this is still activated, yes, no. Um, uh, is generally fairly uniform. Uh, for example, what do we have here? We have Chi, chi ARM. Uh, you could zoom in and, and, and see, but it is fairly, fairly, uh, the bigger contrast is definitely between the interglacials and, and the glacials. At Nusslor, uh, at Nusslor, uh, Sam, uh, we did go, uh, he did go and, and observe throughout all of these tundra glades. Um, And so that we can, because the, the general, the general uh, hypothesis is that uh, you have decreasing grain sizes um, during interglacials, increasing grain sizes during glacials. So that should hold true also for the interstadial stadial stage. So across these, uh, these tundra glaze, you were seeing the, the general trend of overall decreasing uh, uh, grain sizes throughout the tundra glaze. So the, the, the general hypothesis holds true through these, which is one reason why, yes, tundra glaze are incipient soils. And I obviously did not have the time to go into all the details, but all of the um, deformed layers uh, that were observed at Nestlor do not necessarily correlate are not at the same strata, are not necessarily at the same stratigraphic level as the tundra glade, but that would be to it expected because during an interstadial, the tundra glade, if it is the incipient soil, is going to be at the surface. But during an interstadial, you're going to have much thicker active layers. So any uh, water accumulation on a permafrost table would not be at the surface. So you would expect these to not just try to graphically de be decoupled, which is what we observe. But so during stadials and glacials, um, since you have all the, the very uniform grain size of the magnetite, let's say, does that say something about transport processes or source areas or? That would be very difficult to make the, because the grain size is going to be wind dependent, but is also going to be dependent on the distance between the site and the source. So you need to know exactly where the source is to be able to interpret. You would have to have a constant source to, to, to deposit site distance to interpret any grain sizes as being uniquely wind. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I thought I saw one hand raised. See it anymore. So I, I do have a question, but I'm about it's like more a geological question. Do you have any idea of how how much volcanic input are in, in this less um, process? So yes. Um, at uh, at Nostor, for example, there is one uh, there is one tephra uh, that is that is uh, observed. This is actually a focus uh, that Christian spent a lot of time, and that whoever, if you were at EGU, was the focus of the talk that was given at uh, at uh, at EGU. Um, so, like I said, for the Pleven for the Suya uh, Kladineska site, there is one. 20 centimeter thick tephra that is observed in the field. Magnetically, um, there were three other ones that were very suspicious because of very high peaks that we could see in the magnetic data. 
and uh, Diana uh, Jordanova and Nelly, they extracted from, the, they looked through the binocular and they were able to see glass charge for, in, those, in those levels. So that confirms that there are at least three crypto tephras in addition to the, 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 observed, uh, the observed tephra. Then what I presented at EGU uh, is that Christian went through a whole bunch of magnetic characteristics that were common to those four, the, the tephra and the three crypto tephras, as well as calimetry as a characteristic, as well as clay characteristics, especially spectite, and uh, developed a, 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 a scoring of 12. And if there was 12 characteristics that, that were very, that were common to all of those four. And then when he looked across the rest of this, of the, of the site, um, there were 50 other levels that could be suspected because they had scoring of between, let's say five and 10. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So those are all levels that we need. And then with the age model, uh, he then went to known tephra uh, chronological sites like Lake Ored and, um, and the Fukuchino, Fukuchino Basin and based on the ages that his age model was giving for those stratigraphic depths where he had the suspected tephra, he tried to go and see whether there were age tephra at those, at, at those ages in those, in those two uh, basins that are very mm -hmm. nearby and logically could be sending uh, material. Um, so there's quite a few that, were, uh, that are good candidates. So this is also something that is in the works and definitely um, would be very valuable because this is really in terms of uh, regional stratigraphy, lots are very hard to, to, to date. Uh, anything yeah. after a carbon 14 or even the, the OSL above 100, 150,000 years, you're not getting very much precision. Um, it would be fantastic to, to have uh, other stratigraphic markers and the tephra are temporally unique points in time. Yes. So they would be, they're perfect, obviously. Okay. Good, thank you, Franz. Okay. Uh, next talk on my 24th is to be determined. Uh, then we will have a break for IRM meeting and our next talk will be on June 21st. And we have more than 100 presentations you can watch uh, on YouTube.